Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's so good to see you all here this morning. Oh my goodness, uh, I got to see faces that I haven't seen in a while. And I may even see a new face or two out there, but maybe it's just been the two of us that have been there. But most especially, or at least in addition to that, these folks uh, like Sal and, uh, and who else has been out? Sherry. Sherry, yeah. Sherry. 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 And Shirley, yeah. Sal and Shirley have been out, and they're back, and we're just so delighted to see them. Yeah. So let's go to the Lord for Lord prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to uh, fellowship with our brothers and sisters and to hear your word. Uh, Lord, we, we just come here to, to honor you and to praise you and to glorify you. That's our, our purpose for being here this morning. Uh, Lord, we do especially ask that you, you be with Lloyd this morning as he brings us our message and be with their, our praise team as uh, we, we raise our voices in praise to you. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Won't you please stand and join us in singing, Oh, what a beautiful morning it is. What a great opportunity we have to gather together and just raise our voices. Let's sing.
let's see, the, the Christmas box is down here for the, uh, the, the Christmas Child uh, program, and this month we're collecting small dolls, dolls, for the, uh, for that, and so just purchase your dolls, and bring them in, and, and place them in there, and, and uh, next month will be a different project until uh, Christmas time, and we'll put everything up into to boxes and, and uh, set them up for these children. Do you have anything to add to that? Barbie dolls? Okay. That's an easy one. All right. I'll have to get out my collection. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I think we might have a, have a birthday going here this morning with Tom. Birthday? You were going the right way. <laughs> yeah, make sure we can hear you. So how many years ago? Well, I'm old enough to now be called a super senior. <laughs> so that's pretty old. But because I'm a super senior, I should get more respect, right? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding myself. I tried it with my wife, and she just kind of laughs at me. So, But I'm a... Uh, 71. Yay. 70 Yay. wonderful. Any other birthdays that uh, are not into the book? No one wants to anybody who wants to admit that. Okay? Let's see.
time the books of the New Testament were written. Actual people who saw, heard, and touched. He goes on to say, We received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That was the transfiguration, right? We ourselves, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We have also, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The count varies, but there are probably over 300 specific references or prophecies to Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection in the Old Testament. And these have actually been fulfilled. Well, statisticians have punched the numbers on the probability of only eight of those prophecies written centuries before the actual event actually being fulfilled. The probability is roughly 100 quadrillion to 1. That's a 10 with 17 zeros. <laughs> now, well, many of you heard the analogy of the number this big in its relative probability. Take the area the size of Texas, put a two-foot fence around the entire thing, fill that right to the top of that fence with quarters. That's 172 million acres, two feet deep in quarters. Have to make sure that one of the quarters is marked differently from everything else. Fly over it, parachute down, land, reach down, and pick up a quarter. That's one in 100 quadrillion chances of getting that one quarter. <laughs> so I'd say uh, that makes the Bible pretty reliable, wouldn't you? <laughs> Read Psalms 22, written a thousand years ago, or Isaiah, written 750 years before Christ. It's as though King David and the prophet Isaiah were sitting in the shadow of the cross when they wrote their detailed prophetic words. Peter goes on to say, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And I would ask who but God could inspire the words of men who clearly predicted Christ's death on the cross centuries before the Romans ever even conceived the idea of crucifixion. So why do I choose to believe the Bible, and so should you? Well, Dr. Bodhi Bakum, the pastor and author, says it like this, and I've, I've written it down in my, in my Bible. I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents, a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report to a supernatural event that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and they claim that their writings are of divine rather than human origin. So many prophesied miracles have been fulfilled, the most important of which Friday dead Sunday Alive. How do I know this is true? Because the Bible tells me so. We're going to take some time for, for prayer and praise this morning. And uh, Leon's going to be going around with the, uh, with the so if anybody has praise or prayer that you'd like to, uh, to mention to us right here, sure. So I have a praise.
days, I'm praising God for answering prayers and for healing me and for continuing touching me with his hand. And I also want to thank everybody in this church. I am just blessed. All the prayers, the calls, the texts, the um, emails, and the cards. I just can't thank everybody enough, for, especially for the prayers. Thank you. I would like to thank our music. I thank them personally today, but I think that we all need to appreciate the beauty of what these people give us during this time that we can worship. Thank you. Thank you. A big praise my granddaughter gave to her sir. wanted to say thank you for your prayers and support. Our granddaughter has been on the road for about three weeks, Mayo Clinic. She has two titanium rods alongside her spine, about 17 screws, and some other hardware. She was born with spina bifida, so this is a big move for her at age 15. Her spine was about 63 degree angle. It's now pretty much where it should be. She has some more surgeries ahead of her, but your support has been a lot to them and to us. Yesterday afternoon, I got a text about two o'clock, uh, which is nine hours. Uh, earlier or later in Ukraine, Dennis Poshlock, our missionary there, said we just had five massive air missile attacks in Kharkov. Please pray. Just asking her to continue to pray for our daughter, Lauren, that, that cancer does not grow until she has her surgery in June. Also, uh, Steve Krogstad, who is uh, going to have to uh, go under angioplasty uh, this week, so we'll keep him in our prayers as well. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for, for your healing. We thank you for your comfort. We thank you for your peace. Thank you for listening to our prayers. Lord, we have so much to, to praise for and uh, the, the healing of our people here, like Shirley and Sally, uh, we just so much thank you for that, for guiding uh, our fellow worshipers, our brothers and sisters to, to follow up with their prayers and their calls. Uh, we just appreciate that so much. We do appreciate uh, the people who praise you with their voices, with their instruments, but most importantly, these our, our brothers and sisters out here that, that sing so beautifully to your praises and your, to your praises. Lord, we thank you for, for Christy, her granddaughter, Christy Bill's granddaughter, that it has already made a lot of progress in this, uh, in this unfortunate uh, disease that she has, spina bifida. Uh, we pray that you'll continue to be with her, be with her, the families. We give her peace and comfort. We continue to guide those uh, those doctors to where they know what to do and how to do it. Uh, Lord, you know what's going on in, in the Ukraine. You know the people that are trying so desperately to 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 meet the needs of the people in your name. And, and my song is is among those that do that. But there are others as well that we want to pray for this morning to, to keep their strength up, to keep their uh, their spirits up 
and to give them the strength and the discernment to be able to help where they can. Pray, Lord, that uh, you with Lauren and her family. Uh, it's, it's looking pretty bleak for them, but uh, we know that, that you can, can turn hearts and you can heal uh, in your will. Uh, we lift up uh, Steve Crookstead this morning as he prepares to go under angioplasty this week. Pray that you be with he and his wife Marianne uh, to give them comfort and peace through this whole thing. Lord, we just thank you for all that you are. We thank you for your unchanging characteristic, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and let's continue our worship. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you. It's nice to 
see old friends that we haven't seen for a long time, too. We're glad that you're with us here today. I want to welcome those folks that are going to be watching this later this week on YouTube. We miss you, and we're looking forward to seeing you this summer. So, we're going to continue now by, uh, I guess we're going to dismiss Marita and the little children. All right? So, the young folks now, you can go with uh, Marita. You guys are going to have a special time. She's have, I understand she's having a raffle back there. They're giving away a new camera. <laughs> It's always a pleasure to come here, and uh, I, I uh, yes, several several years ago, Bruce asked me after the after the shepherds conference, he said, "Would you would you come so I can get a week off?" <laughs> 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 Working so hard listening, so 
So, I, it's, you know, I just, I love coming. It's, uh, it's always kind of uh, interesting. I mean, I know exactly when I'm going to be. I put it on the schedule now. So, if he doesn't ask me, I might just show up anyway. <laughs> so. But as, as Bruce said, uh, Suzette and I are at Camp Latin Most, which probably most of you are, at least are a little bit familiar with it. Um, if you drive to Missoula, if you don't know where it is, just pass the big, it's not a cow, it's a steer, just want to let you all know that. <laughs> People always describe it as a big cow, and, I, and it's even on our, on our website, we describe it, and I go, that's actually a steer. And they go, well, how do you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> I realize that that's probably a sensitive thing in this day and age, but there is still a way to tell. And so, but anyway, after you turn at the big steer, and turn towards Missoula, and we're a mile and a half, towards Missoula on Highway 200, and there's a, a sign there with a crossbar that says Camp Blackmost, and, uh, and we're up in there. So if you've never been there, you've driven by it many times, and swing on up there. I was telling somebody this morning, we don't shoot at you until we know who you are, so if you just come, uh, you know, never, never have. And uh, there's nobody else up there, uh, just go and just to get a glimpse of the camp. Um, out here we have a display, so if, uh, if it is totally new to you, you can look, and we've got some pictures out there that kind of give a little background of the camp, and, um, and then there's also a couple flyers you can take, one is, which just has our camp dates on it, so you can keep track of that, um, and then there's also a thing which we've had a couple of the girls here, um, Jayla and Emma, I know Jayla's not here, I don't even see Emma here right now unless I'm just missing it, but I know she's a, a big part of, of you guys here, and uh, both those girls have, have served um, with us as, as interns. A lot of you others have helped in many different ways, and we thank you so much for that. Um, last year, the BBS kids raised money for us to, to buy new rafts and, uh, and some rafting supplies, and so a lot of you were involved in that. So thank you so much for that. I just got those rafts delivered. They're in boxes, and uh, so we've got them. I, can, I was going to take a picture just to show you, but you really don't care. They're just cardboard boxes. And, uh, but inside of that, there's some, some very needed rafts. We like to cycle through what we do um, all the time. So. Um, but anyway, we, we are, uh, it's a, a camp that is going, a lot of people think it's just summer, but it goes year round. We actually have people there right now that we, uh, that we there's, realistically, the, the only weekend we have open um, is Mother's Day. And I just always tell people when a guy calls up and says, yeah, we're looking to do a men's retreat, it's like, I'm going to tell you what, it's only open on Mother's Day weekend. And in wisdom, I would not do that. <laughs> and I have not explained that any farther to anybody. And um, unless it's a Friday, Saturday deal. And then the next opening that we don't have somebody there, and even now a lot of times there's people there throughout the week, um, the next opening is actually the middle of November. So that just gives you a little idea, and then we're, we're a little bit slow from mid-November to the, to the end of December, and then it picks up again, and it's just people there all the time. So it's really cool that, uh, um, I, I only tell you that so that you know that it's a place that God is just constantly working. And, uh, and it's pretty cool that, uh, that there's, something like that going on all the time. So your, your prayers and your gifts, your support, um, the, the way you are involved in camp in different ways is so appreciated. Um, some of you have worked there um, on um, just even sending us wood. We just got done doing the doing a little bit more work inside the, of the cabin. So uh, we always call Bruce and, and Carol and say, hey, could you make us some more wood here? And uh, I know there's some of the other guys that help with that, so thanks so much for that. Um, there's a lot of you who just send kids, make it available for kids to go. You send kid, your kids and other kids and grandkids in the past. Um, we just pray that you would just keep that up. Um, just in, in short, we're just thankful for the for Condon and their, their faithfulness, not only to the Lord, but to us as a camp. Um, the, the Condon in this church is a vital part of Camp Light Most, and so uh, we just thank you so much for that. Um, I, you know, sometimes I give a lot more description than that, but that's it. That's it today. So, um, Suzette and I have been there for 15 years. We've been, I'll give you a little bit more in the sense that Suzette actually grew up at the camp. So, we've been plugged into it for a really long time. I showed up there like Jayla and Emma did in 1981, just out of college as an intern. And uh, we've been plugged into that camp ever since. So, it's not just something that we've, we've been there in, in this position for 15 years, but we've been involved in that camp in, in many different ways for a, for a long time. It's in our blood. We love it. And, uh, and right now, we have um, our son and his wife are, are working there now. That's the other picture that's out there, the other daily. That's not us when we were younger. That is uh, the younger dailies there. 
Um, and we're, we're excited to have them on. They joined us two years ago. We had just grown the ministry to it, to where it was more than just like two, than one couple. So it needs two couples there um, running up, um, everything. They've taken on a lot of the summer ministry. And uh, so it's, it's great having them. And someday, we're not leaving yet. And I was like, people say, I hear you're retired. Because they hear that, that uh, Brian and, and Kenny are there. It's like, well, yeah, I did retire from building many years ago. <laughs> I'm not retired from here. I'll keep on working. And, uh, and my real goal is that someday I'm going to just be the maintenance man there. And, um, and so, so we're just thankful to have Brian and Kimmy there now taking on what they're doing and uh, just being a part of that ministry. So, um, so we, just, we just ask you for your continued prayer and support for, uh, for all of us in the ministries that goes on there. Um, and then as others start joining us here pretty quick for our summer staff, it's, um, it's primarily volunteer outside of those that serve as interns. Um, we, we do, they raise support, and you guys have uh, been very good about that. This summer, we're starting a new thing. So if you're a high school student, we're starting a, a new thing called our CIT, which is Counselor and Training. And uh, they, we've got several high school kids already that will be coming and spending the summer with us. We'll also take others just for a week at a time. But um, with the counselors in training, um, so there's information out there for, on, on the table uh, for that too. Um, you, you come, you serve for the summer, you go to high school camp, and then you serve the rest of the summer. Um, our camp start with high school kids and then go all the way down to those that are going into fourth grade. And, uh, and you, we even help you raise some support, just so uh, it, in a sense it serves as a replacement for a summer job. But um, it's, it's also giving you an opportunity to serve all summer long. So anyway, there's just some quick information for that. I got I to gotta say, when I saw your, your thing come up and it said, it's got parentheses around the three, and it said, it said when I read it, and I've got this problem, I, I read so fast sometimes, not because I'm super sharp, but I just read so fast, and then I get all kinds of really cool messages sometimes. And so here I see that Condon is going to have junior church for those that are 13 through third grade. <laughs> Well, they're a little slower in Condon, maybe, but uh, this is kind of like my place because I feel like that sometimes. I uh, I, I got to go. Uh, I talk about my first grade teacher that um, I got to know really well because I had her for two years. Figure that one out. <laughs> so uh, so so when I see something like that, you'll understand. That's why he was in first grade for two years. But uh, there is. There's lots to say about that. It was a good start, though. I just want you to know, I really learned my alphabet well. So, um, let me just open up in prayer, and then we're going to get into the Word. Heavenly Father, thank, thank you so much for, for your Word. And as Chuck was, was just giving us a little lesson before, how vital it is, from old to new, um, even up through today. We are just so thankful for your Word. Thank you for, for what you bring to us through it. Lord, would you just speak through me to all of us today? And we just ask for your help. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After Chuck got done with his, uh, with, with his little deal, I always feel like, well, you know something? I could just walk up there and preach Jesus's and John the Baptist's first sermon, which was simply this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Amen. And sit down. You guys would all love that. And uh, we could just go, Chuck preached such a good sermon right there. We don't need any more than that. But I'm going to give you some more. Um, you know, I, uh, I often say that I speak from my journal. So if you get convicted today, I didn't go, what should I preach to those kind of people? I always pray, Lord, would you teach me, would you take me through what I need to preach about? And, uh, and so this message is a message that God brought to me for me, first of all. And then I'm just sharing it with you. And if you get your toes stepped on, sorry. But now you know how I feel. Okay, um, you know it's uh, the word of God is just powerful that way, and uh, and so we're, I just know that God's going to do amazing things. Approximately two centuries ago, a band of, of brave souls became known as One Way missionaries. They purchased single single tickets, one way tickets to the mission field, obviously on a boat, without the return half of that of that ticket. And instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings that they took with them in coffins. As they sailed out of port, they waved goodbye to everyone they loved, everything they knew, and they knew that they would never return home. That was their plan. A.W. Um, Milne was one of those missionaries. He set sail for the South, South Pacific, knowing full well 
that the headhunters who lived where he was going had martyred every missionary who, who went there before him. Bill Linton Milne didn't fear for his life. Why? Because he had already died to himself, and his coffin was packed, and he was ready to go. For 35 years, he lived among those, uh, those natives in that tribe. He loved them. They began to love him. They turned their hearts to Christ. And he had an amazing ministry in that 35 years, and that's where I sit. As I said, he died there. When he died, the, the tribe buried him in the middle of their village and inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. We often live, uh, live our Christian lives like it's a safe place to reside. It may be hard to imagine um, the, re the renowned theologian J.I. Packer sitting in a hot tub. I, I don't know if you ever read his stuff, but I have a really tough <laughs> picture in that. Um, but this is where he was, we, and he made this quote. He was talking to some other, other guys in there. Um, he said, the other day, as I sat, sat there savoring my hot tubness, cracking small jokes and adjusting, the feel of, um, adjusting to feeling the bubbles all, all, over, all over me from every angle, it struck me that the hot tub is the perfect symbol of the modern root in, in religion. The hot tub experience is sensuous, relaxing, floppy, laid back, not in any way demanding, but very, very nice, even to the point of being great fun. When did we start believing that God wants to send us to safe places to do the easy thing? That faithfulness is holding the fort. That playing it safe is um, that playing it safe is safe. That there is any greater privilege than um, than sacrifice. That radical is anything but normal. Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. The complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ isn't radical. It should be normal for a Christian. It's time to quit living as if for the, the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. It's time to go all out for the all in all. Here's a challenge. Pack your coffin. Are we following Jesus or are we just expecting him to follow us? I, I know that for, for, a, for me a lot of times it's like, Lord, I pray this to, and I just pray that you'll go with me and we'll, and we'll be successful for you. Instead of praying... Lord, I'm going to go in here. I just want to pray that, you, that I am following you into this place and that you'll be successful and you'll use me as part of that. What do you want me to do with my life? Way back in the Old Testament, as the Israelites had already come through the wilderness, they'd been, um, they'd been rescued from Egypt. They had had the rebellious time in the, in the wilderness. And they're now finally, after 40 years, about to cross the Jordan River into the, into the Promised Land. God told them this as they were getting ready to go. Remember, this is a new, a new uh, nation in a sense because it's a new generation that had grown up. Everybody who took off that was 20 years and older were now dead except for Joshua and Caleb. But before entering the promised land, um, Joshua was told this. God told him, he says, go, go say this to them. Consecrate yourselves because tomorrow God will do amazing things for us. It's in Joshua 3.5. Before entering the promised land, the Israelites were to perform a purification ceremony called consecration. This was often done before making sacrifices, or as in this case, before witnessing a great act of God. God's law stated that a person could become unclean for many reasons. And if you ever wonder about that, just read through. I'm, I'm going through, as I can see from your both, well, some of you are reading through the Bible this year. Isn't Leviticus just, boy, ain't that just sharp? <laughs> I just love it. I mean, that's the, that's the book we all memorize all the time. But it's like, my word, when you read through that, I just go, I am so thankful for Jesus. I mean, there's such a point in all of that to look at. You just go, I am so thankful for Jesus. Because I don't have to go out and chase my goats around and, and grab one of them just so I can go um, be right before God. I can get on my knees and I can, through the grace of God, because of, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can, we can just pray. Pray our, our, and ask for our forgiveness to make, make our confession. God used these outward signs of uncleanliness to illustrate as the, as, the, as the Israelites had to go through to, to um, 
that they came as a that those that uncleanliness came as a result of sin. This purification ceremony called consecration was important in approaching God with a pure heart and mind. Like the Israelites, I just ask us, we need forgiveness to cleanse our hearts and minds before we approach Him. We need to consecrate, just like they did. Consecrate ourselves. Joshua had gathered the people to hear the words of the Lord. Their excitement was high. No doubt they wanted to rush into action, but Joshua made them stop, listen to what God wanted to, them, uh, to, to tell them at the moment, and, and then they would go on. You can imagine that they're finally there. I mean, realize that uh, 40 years, it's a long time. And for some of these guys, they were little babies. Others were, were in, in late teens, and now they're, they're close to 60. And they're anxious to finally get to go into the promised land. Even their great leader, Moses, uh, wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. He was, he was dead now. Joshua's their new leader. And they're getting ready to go. We, today, live in a fast-paced age where everyone is rushing here and there to keep up with a, with a full agenda. We get caught up in the next task. We're so busy that sometimes we fail to listen to God. Too busy to see what's most important. Before diving into your agenda each day, pause for a moment. Focus on listening to God and seeking to know what He wants for you. Hearing from God before you rush into your day will remind you of His presence and clarify what he wants you to do, uh, what he wants to do through you and in you. I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm thankful that many years ago I, um, that I started having daily devotions. And um, I, honestly, I wasn't even a Christian when I started reading the Bible every day. I did it because of a competition from camp. Um, and uh, that was a challenge to read my Bible every day. Well, the speaker said, you know, there's a, there's a, a chapter in Proverbs for every day of the month. And so, um, you read a chapter uh, for this for the next month. Read a chapter of Proverbs every day. And uh, I was 16 years old, and I went, nah, I can do that because next year I could come up at the at this campfire dedication thing and say, I did that, and I'm going to go one better. I'm going to do it for 12 months. So I'm proud to say that I did it. And uh, and so I've got I read Proverbs every day for that year. And I got up there and I was able to, to stand up and go, I did it every day and proudly threw my stick in the fire. But you know, the thing that it established was, it established me reading the Bible every day. So I said, I'm going to do it again for another year. Somehow in that year, God finally got a hold of me. <laughs> and the Word of God, which is alive and active, um, impacted me in a major way. And uh, the next year at, at camp, I would say, you know, I did that all last year. But here's a greater thing. I gave my heart to Christ. And, uh, and, but I still do that. I still read Proverbs just about every day still. You know, Max, that was, I hate to say, oh, young. I mean, that was like 50 years ago now. <laughs> wow, you old. But, uh, but you know what? You think I'd have it memorized. I don't. But I'm just going to say that the good thing it's done, it's gotten me in the Word of God. And I read more than just Proverbs. But it's gotten me in the Word of God. And it's just, I feel like I, you know, I, like I went to bed without brushing my teeth if I had spent the day doing that. No, I didn't do that. So I, I've just been fortunate that I started out that in the morning. So with that, I, I only tell you that story just to say, give you a challenge. Spend time in the Word of God every day. Consecrate yourself. And it doesn't mean that I started because I'm so good because I've done this every day for so long. Um, it's no pat on my back. It's like, it just shows me like, man, well, I'd be a real wreck. I'm a wreck now. Uh, what a wreck I would be if I didn't do that every day. So well, with all that, so, so what is consecration? It's like the, the nation of Israel has said, go consecrate yourself. Get ready for this great thing because God is going to do amazing things. I, I love that. It's, uh, he's going to do amazing things. If we have hearts that are right before God and we, and we go, not God following us, but us going, following God, he's going to do amazing th things. So what is consecration? Well, let me just start out with this, but it's not, first of all, okay? It's not living religious, going to church, doing services, etc. It's more than behavior modifications. It actually means to set yourself apart in full devotion. Giving God veto power of your life. Giving God control of all that you do. Giving God control of your money, of the things you do, the things you think about, everything. Consecration is going all in and all out. 
for God. When you decide to follow Him, no matter what, no matter where and no matter when, then you're going to be amazed by what God does. All in to go all out. If you don't, if you uh, if you don't, you can't walk across the Jordan on dry ground. Here's the rest of that story, and it's not even I think that's what I'm going to preach on today. Okay, no, I'm just, <laughs> this is part of it. It's introduction. Okay, they they got to understand that they walked the Jordan River was rushing at that time. It was flood time, and it was just rushing. And the amazing thing is that the river didn't stop until they stepped into the water. When the priests stepped in there with the Ark of the Covenant, they walked out, and the water stopped. And then the rest of the nation walked across dry land. See, because until we, until we do that, we can't walk on dry ground. Until we consecrate ourselves, we get ourselves ready, and then we have to take off following God to see where He wants to go. Think about this, is that consecration, it, it always ends with amazing. Uh, think about Abraham putting his son Isaac on the altar. Think about David going to face Goliath. Think about Peter walking on the water. Paul on his missionary journeys. God doesn't do because of us. He does in spite of us. In the 16th century, the Renaissance astronomer Nicholas of Copernicus challenged the belief that the earth was the center of the universe. That's what they taught at that time. I think about, it was, an, it was a kind of a wild time of uh, in the universe, if you think it's crazy now, it was pretty crazy back then, because here comes this guy, Copernicus, who says, actually the, the, the sun does not revolve around the earth, it's the other way around, the earth revolves around it. And that was like, he had a lot of argument against him on that, and he he was finally able to, um, to explain it, and, uh, and with mathematical calculations show this is what happens. We all know that it's just fact now. Think about the same time when, uh, when everybody thought the world was flat. So as the explorers took off, um, people, people wouldn't go any farther than what they could see because they'd fall off the edge of the, of the world. It, it sounds ludicrous now, doesn't it? But that's what they thought. Magellan finally sailed around, the, around the, the whole globe, proving that you can go from one place to the next in the same direction and get back. He died right before he got back, but his crew finished the journey. Um, and, and many other explorers that, uh, that did the same thing. But, uh, but Copernicus, it, it, what, he, what he did was, has been known as the Copernican Revolution. And it turned the scientific world upside down by turning the universe inside out. As I said, if you think today is, is unsettling, put yourself back in the 16th century. Their world was coming apart as well as, as well, and people thought. Um, fought them for what they believed was true. Just a little encouragement to say, fight for what is true. We're being really, we're, we're in the midst of a battle. You know that. Keep fighting. Be bold. Be dangerous. Give God His story through your life. Many of us in the Christian world think we are following Jesus, but in many ways, as I've said earlier, we may think we are following Jesus, but the reality is we have invited Jesus to follow us wherever we go. We call him Savior, but the reality is we have never surrendered to him as Lord. I know for myself that when I finally asked Jesus into my life, it was still a couple years before I really made Jesus my Lord. I know that as a kid, I asked Jesus into my heart many, many times. Every time the opportunity was there, my, my deep theology tells me I was probably saved, but I don't know. But I can tell you this, Jesus was not the Lord of my life until I was 18 years old. All of those things that we talked about in consecration, um, it's more than behavior modification, it's more than conforming to a moral code, it's more than doing good deeds, it's something deeper, it's something way tr truer than that. This is a reminder, by, by definition, consecration demands full of devotion. It is dethroning yourself and enthroning Jesus Christ. It's the complete departure of self-interest. It's giving God the veto power, surrendering all of who you are to Him. It's a simple recognition that every second of time, every ounce of energy, every penny of money is a gift from God and for God. Consecration is an ever-deepening love for Jesus, a childlike trust in the Heavenly Father, and a blind obedience to the Holy Spirit. Consecration is all that and a thousand things more, but for the sake of simplicity, let me give you my, uh, 
I would just remind you this again, is that consecration is going all in, all out, for the all in all. When you look back on your life, the greatest moments will be the moments when you went all in. It's true today, as, as it was to, um, way back, that Abraham placed Isaac on the altar. In the same way for so many other things as we talked about. In, in, verse, in uh, Luke chapter 9, um, if you want to turn to that, Luke chapter 9, there was, uh, Jesus talks about the cost of following Jesus. Luke chapter 9, I'm going to start reading, I'm just going to read a few verses here, starting at, at verse 57. Luke 9, 57. As they were walking along, as Jesus and the disciples and some others that were just following along, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. When you look at that story, when you look at what he did, it's like, it's like, holy cow, Jesus, it's kind of kind of rough there on people, aren't you? And I, I always think that, that maybe I would be kind of like Peter, who was, who was always trying to correct Jesus in some of the things he said. And then what did Jesus tell Peter one time? Get behind me, Satan. It's pretty, pretty uh, bold there. But it's like, but, but here Jesus is just going, you, the following me is a pretty serious commitment. Way before that, he even, he even said in verse 23, Then he turned to his disciples and he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many... I'm, I've got the wrong passage there. I'm in chapter 10, no wonder. That's a great passage there. <laughs> I preach all kinds of sermons sometimes. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life and lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. And in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. A lot of, uh, a lot of heavy stuff there. You know, sometimes, as I say, we, we like to make asking Jesus in your heart is just a, um, a simple little thing that we do. It's, it's just a, a figure of speech. It's, it's asking Jesus to come and to be the Lord of my life. That I will then follow and go wherever you ask me to go. Take up your cross daily and follow me. In AD 44, King Herod ordered that James the Greater, one of the disciples, be thrust with a sword. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. Christianity, and he was very angry. She was listening to Philip preach when she converted. Philip continued to preach even while he was on a cross. Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in, Arme in, in Armenia. James the Just, the other James of the disciples, was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. After surviving the 100-foot fall, he was clubbed to death by a mob. Simon the Zealot was crucified by the governor of Syria. Judas, or Thaddeus, the other Judas, was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, the one who denied Jesus, was stoned to death and then beheaded. And Peter, who we all know well, was crucified upside down at his own request because he didn't want to suffer the same death that Jesus did. Didn't feel that he was worthy of that. John who even calls himself the Beloved, is the only disciple that died a natural, a natural death. But that's only because he survived his own execution. He had oil. That, well, a cauldron of oil was poured on him, and it didn't kill him. Imagine that. 
I, I don't know if you've ever been burnt, and I've dumped some hot stuff on me. I've dumped coffee on me before, and it's like, oh, that hurts. This guy had a cauldron of oil dumped on him, and he survived. And then, they, then he was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos, where he lived until his death in 1895. That's where he wrote Revelation from. These are guys that were sold out. If you turn with me to Luke 18, chapter 18, just go a little bit farther. 18, starting at verse 18. This is a story that is in three of the Gospels. Um, we know it as the rich ruler, or a lot of times we call him the rich young ruler. It's interesting that, that Matthew is the only one that calls him a young guy. We don't know that. We can assume that he probably was young. And, and when it's talking about money, I understand this about Matthew, um, is that he understood that. Remember, he was a tax collector. He knew what it was like to cheat people out. He knew what it was like to have a lot of stuff and then give it up because Jesus came to him and he said, follow me. That was, his, that was it. Didn't have a big debate. I've always loved that, that, that these disciples, um, Jesus said, follow me, and they just gave up what they were doing and went. Matthew was one of them. He said, follow me, and he followed him. But no matter what, it, it's a, I, let me start at verse 18. It's the, it's the story of a, of a ruler, or in other words, a, a leader. That's probably what the ruler meant. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. And the guy's going, what on earth could I be lacking? I have done everything. I've followed all the commandments. I've done all this stuff since I was a little kid. And here's just the thing you've got to understand that a lot of us, we, we sit there and we make, we make this list for our Christianity of, of how we're going to have a right relationship with God by listing out our merits. Well, God, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. My wife doesn't like to think of this, and I don't like to remind her of it. But uh, there was a time when uh, there was just, boy, my world was falling apart. And she can remember, and I was, I was in, I was a youth pastor. Um, I was a, a businessman. Things were going well. But all of a sudden, things were not going so well. And, and my relationship with God on the inside had really deteriorated. And she can remember me standing out in the yard, shaking my fist at the sky. was not a happy time in my life. It was not a happy time in her life. She moved to a different house for a little while so the lightning wouldn't hit her. I'm just kidding. But, uh, but she was just going, man, the lightning is going to come down and blast this dude. Um, I'm just thankful for the grace of God. But you know, but as I, I can remember sitting out there going, I say, God, I've done all this stuff for you. I give faithfully. I read your word faithfully. I serve faithfully, and you let this happen to me. A lot of you could say that same thing. And I was so angry with God because why? i have been keeping this list, and yet something was really missing. Well, in this case, as this, as this young ruler said, I have kept all these since I was a boy. And Jesus said, you still lack one thing. And here's what I'm asking you to do. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Think of all those other people that, that came and said, I want to follow you. And Jesus gave that little list of, of people that follow me can't, can't have any other obstructions in life other than to just follow me. So, and it says here that the problem was, it said when he heard this, when the young ruler heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And did, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That, that second bunch is a whole other sermon, but I'd just like to end that part of it with this, and that those who heard then said, Then who can be saved? And Jesus re replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And that's the key thing to remember that is that no matter what we do, God can still do amazing things through us. You know, it really wasn't just the fact that this guy had to give, the, give everything up and follow God. It wasn't, God wasn't saying, all the rest of you people just give up all your money. The whole point is, is that 
it shows that this young guy was so wrapped up in his finances that he couldn't let he couldn't let that stuff go and follow Jesus. We know that um, we know that this guy was was uh, following the rules, but he wasn't following Jesus. Righteousness is doing everything right. And the problem is we've made it to be this. Um, we've made it to be doing nothing wrong. I love it when my kids, especially when they're little growing up. I loved it when they did nothing wrong. It was great. All of us could say, boy, I wish my kids never did anything wrong. But you know what I like even more? It's when they did something right. It's when I, I hear a story still of my, of my kids telling me, um, hey, Dad, I, I did this, not because I had to, but I just knew it was the right thing to do. And, and that's really what, what this all comes down to. It's not... It's not getting our righteousness before God by doing all the things right. It's by doing things that are difficult and still doing them. Taking things that that's really difficult, but I'm still going to go do that. To Jesus, it wasn't all, all the, uh, the stuff that this guy wouldn't give up. It was just the fact that Jesus loved him so much. Because we can look at that story too and go, man, Jesus, you're kind of hard on him. Here he was ready to follow you. I mean, just think of it. With his finances, he might have, might have allowed you to do a whole lot more ministry than you could. But Jesus goes, uh, yeah, but the problem is I want his heart. I, he wants all of our hearts. Jesus loved the young rich ruler. He invited him to give up everything so that he could gain even more. Uh, you know, we don't know the rest of the story of that guy. I'm just hoping that, that he was one of the ones that became a follower of Jesus later on, and help turn the world upside down, as, as so many did. We don't know. We, I, I just hope that he can become the old rich ruler who, who had never given up all of these things for, for the sake of Christ. Compare this wealthy young leader to the wealthy tax collector, Zacchaeus. If you want to go a little bit farther, I'm not going to read the story, but in the next chapter, um, just go through. I love to read the Bible sometimes. I've got this, um, I use the NIV that's got these, uh, all these headings, and I like to just read sometimes, read the Bible just by, by going through and reading the, reading the titles. Um, just try that sometime. Just go through the Gospels and just do that. It's pretty fun to just because if you're familiar with them, those stories will come to mind. Chapter 19 starts off with Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Here we've got another tax collector, another guy who had great wealth. And Jesus said to him, he said, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus come down immediately. Zacchaeus had climbed up in a tree, if you're not familiar with that story, and uh, because he wanted to see Jesus. And, he, and Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down from there. I'm going to go stay at your house. And Zacchaeus came down one, uh, immediately and welcomed Jesus into his house. Jack, Zacchaeus says, as Jesus impacted him, he even said this. He said, he stood up and said to the Lord, in verse 8, he stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. See the difference in attitude there? It's like, yeah, well, he only gave up half of his stuff. Jesus asked the other, can he give up all of it? Yeah, well, he gave up half of it, and then he said, if I've cheated anybody, and I can guarantee you that as a tax collector, he had cheated a lot of people. So he probably spent a pretty good portion of the rest of his stuff, giving them back four times what he, was taken, what he had taken from them. <laughs> At some point, the Holy Spirit is going gonna, is gonna, to um, prompt you to make a decision. I'm just going to say, don't ignore it. I referred a little bit to, uh, to Elisha, and I'm going to just uh, close with this but way back in 1 Kings. 1 Kings 19. We kind of have a, a similar story of, of uh, as Jesus had with some of his disciples coming to him. E e Elijah was the, was the main prophet at the time. He was the one that, was, uh, he's the one that called down fire from heaven, as a, just as a reminder. Um, he ate up the sacrifice, and then he went and they went and killed all the, the false prophets. And we feel like doing that sometimes, I know. But um, the times were a little bit different. I can't explain all that. But, uh, but anyway, Elijah was the prophet in the day. And Elisha wanted to follow 
after him. He had wanted to give us his life, um, essentially give his life to following God. And, uh, and so he came to him, and, uh, and he told Elisha, or Elisha told Elijah, he wanted to follow him. So in, in verse 19 of chapter 19 of 1 Kings, so 1 Kings 19, 19. So Elijah went from there, and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing, um, Elisha was, was plowing with his 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Now just to, get, to give you a little picture of that, if you've got 12 yoke of oxen, you've got a lot of farmland that you're plowing. That means he was a pretty wealthy guy, and he was even out there working too. So it's not that just that um, he gave up his, that he was out there plowing with one. He had 12 yoke of oxen and had people working for him. Elijah went up to, went up to him, Elisha, and he threw his cloak around him, which was a sign of, hey, I want you to be my follower. And, he, and Elisha then took his oxen and ran after, uh, he left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah said. What have I done to you? This is kind of a, Elijah feels a little bit slighted by this whole thing. It's like, I called this guy, God asked me to go talk to him, and I did it. I've given him my cloak, which was a huge symbol at that time, and this guy wants to keep on doing what he's doing. Wait until my parents die. Let me go say goodbye to them. That's kind of what he was saying. So Elisha left him and he went back to where his oxen and, and, uh, were. Um, and he slaughtered them. He even burnt the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and he became his, his attendant. That's sacrifice. That's when he's, when he's shown, okay, I, I get the point here. I'm going to take this serious. And so instead of just going and telling, um, telling everybody, take my, take my plow and my oxen, uh, he went and slaughtered them. He even used his plow for the, for the wood to, to sacrifice and cook the oxen. Burn the plow, slaughter the oxen, go all in, all out, for the all in all. You know, it's just a, it's a, a challenge that I just give you. I'm, I'm constantly dealing with this all the time. I'm in ministry. You think, yeah, he's given up a lot to go there, I, I guess. Um, we, we haven't missed a meal yet. Nobody comes and, and chases us down. They thank us for doing what we're doing. But you know something? Each day I have to say, Lord, just take my life and use me however it is that you want to use me. Go all out for the all in all. That's my challenge today to you guys. And... Um, and I just, I just pray that we would, we would do that, that we, um, we would do these things that we've talked about, take up the cross, follow after Jesus, giving him everything, as Elisha did here, as the disciples did, as Abraham did, even with Isaac, put it all on the altar, knowing that God would do amazing things. Let's just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for, for your word. I thank you for the challenges that it brings to us. Lord, I, I just thank you that when you call us to do, oh, just out of this world things, that you don't just leave us on our own. I am thankful that you give us the strength. We, we are so thankful for the Holy Spirit that guides us and directs us. I pray that each one of us would just have hearts that are sensitive to you and sacrificial to you, and that we would then follow you wherever you, you ask us to go, that we'll do whatever you ask us to do. I just pray that we would be all in. We pray all this in Jesus' name.
you so much that, uh, for the ministry that Lloyd and Suzette have at Camp Father, and for their faithfulness in following you, and for, just for bringing them here today just to share with us what you had laid on their heart. And Father, I pray that we all did take it to heart, that we have surrendered our lives completely to you, Father, and we understand from your word, and as Lloyd shared today, that you never promised that a follower of yours would be an easy life, Father. But you did tell us that you would be with us always and never leave, never forsake us. And we just thank you for the comfort and the peace that comes from being a child of God. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.